Okay, we are on the air. Uh, this is uh, Paranormal Activity um, with www.windycityhometown.com, the uh, Windy City Hometown Network. Um, doing a show here Monday evenings, uh, like once a month or so. We're doing a show every three weeks or so, Paranormal Activity, and it's going well so far. Uh, with me tonight, I've got uh, two special guests. Some of this is going to be paranormal. You know, when I'm here, I throw in the paranormal stuff. Some of this will not be paranormal, but um, anybody, anytime I'm talking here, you just kind of, you know, jump into the to the thing here. Anytime you got something to say about that. Um, and I kind of run the format. If you've listened to the show a couple of times, you know, if you listen to some of the shows I've done with WARG Radio, you know how I kind of do things there. I do some newspaper announcements, uh, introduce my guests who I've got with me tonight, and then we just uh, start talking. We run an open forum on that. And then we do a few things in closing, and we go with that. Uh, tonight, I've got a couple of guests, uh, actually both gentlemen I'm very happy to have on. Uh, Mr. Todd Paulson, who kind of disappeared from everybody's lives uh, at Woodward Radio there for about a, a month. What is it, about a month or a ten month, years? Month, about a month, yeah. Almost exactly this week. Yeah, Todd, Todd disappeared, so he's with us this evening. And then we have Mr. Michael Long. And Mike is um, running for mayor of Summit, the village where I live. And he's uh, running for that, 32 years on the police force, retired. Now he decided to... Uh, Run on the Forest, and welcome to Paranormal Radio, Mike. Thank you very yeah, much. Nice for to have you with us. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much. My okay, pleasure. I'm going to do some. Yeah, we're glad to have you here. I'm going to do some uh, newspaper stuff that I find. Not all this is paranormal related, but these are things I find that I think are kind of interesting, and then I cut them out in between shows, and then I bring them in. Uh, one of these I thought was really good because it's right up my alley here. Uh, the former WGN TV anchor from Creature Features. I don't know if you're old enough. I know you are, Mike. Oh, you're I remember Creature Features. You don't remember. Sure. Every Creature Saturday Features. night. Saturday night at 1030 with that creepy music and the coffin would open. and uh, Experiment Mr. in terror. Yep. Mr. Marty McNeely used to host that show, and he passed away, and it's his obituary. And they put the uh, the logo they used to If you remember the show well enough, they had. I wish I had the music. I'd play the music, and then I would do this. It, the opening to the show used to go, Gruesome Ghouls and Grizzly Ghosts, Wretched Souls and Cursed Host, Vampires Bite and Villains Creep, Dillman's, Demons Scream and Shadows Sleep, Blood Runs Cold and Every Man, Fog Rolls In and Coffin Slam, Mortals Quake and Full Moon Rise, Creatures Haunt and Terrorize. And that's how the show opened every Saturday night, Creature Features, with that creepy music and that coffin, uh, coffin open up there. And uh, he passed away. So that's a part of uh, Chicago history that's gone from us, and I don't know if someone else is ever going to pick that show up again. I wish they would, because I used to love Creature Features. I watched it all the time. Uh, something which ties in with what I'm going to do tonight, if you looked at my Facebook post, I put down, uh, don't buy tickets for Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, because tonight we're going to play the record of it. Uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the, the play is back into town again. I'm seeing that tomorrow. Oh, you're seeing it? Yeah. Oh, well, but you're too early for that. Well, you have to you save your money. You play the record, you hear the whole thing. Oh, and then, then you're wanna, right. Okay. And you have to go get a refund. What are you paying for those tickets? They're free. He gets free <laughs> tickets. You gotta let me know how you do this. You get a lot of free stuff, I still and I know how you do it. Yeah, yes. so, I still got twenty dollars from you floating around. So I know how I know how you operate. So yeah. Anyway, this is about to play Doctor and Jekyll and Mr Hyde, which is coming into town, and uh, I've got an old recording from a nineteen a nineteen oh eight Columbia disc of the transformation scene of Doctor Jekyll and Mr Hyde. So at the end of the show today, we're going to play that for you. Uh, that's it's a kind of short run though. It's only going to be here for like two weeks or so. I think it's in town. It's done on know. the twenty fourth. Yeah. Done on twenty fourth. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then this is since we just got through with St Patrick's Day some stuff about St. Patrick. And I found this article in the Clear Ridge. It's like the local paper where I live. And they had some interesting facts about St. Patrick that he actually was not Irish. Uh, he was actually taken as captive. He was a, a citizen of Britain and then brought into Ireland. And then he escaped out of slavery and uh, came back to Ireland. He had this mission of uh, opening churches and, and converting uh, Ireland to Christianity, to the Catholic faith. And he opened churches all over Ireland and started, um, I guess, the Catholic faith in Ireland. And a couple of the myths about him is, no, he did not chase the snakes out of Ireland, and corned beef and cabbage is not a traditional Irish dish. I was surprised to find this out. I'm not Irish myself, but I know we always have it on St. Patrick's. Um, the actual Irish dish was Irish bacon. And when the Irish immigrants came to this country, uh, Irish bacon was too expensive. I don't even know what Irish bacon is. I don't know if it's like a Canadian well, I'm bacon. Irish or, I don't know either. I don't know what I know that Canadian is. Canadian bacon, that's about it. Canadian bacon, yeah. But I, I never heard of Irish bacon, but it was too expensive, so they substituted with corned beef. And that's what they ate on St. Patrick's Day. So I just thought those were a couple little articles we did. Was there, there a thing in there about the snakes? Yeah, he did not chase the snakes out of Ireland. Right, because I, I read something today about how the types of snakes that there are, none could live that far north in Europe. Oh, so he actually had nothing to do with it. It was climate control. Mm -hmm. Oh. Well, so Fun much fact. for that myth. Yeah, that's, that's one of those <laughs> myths that we dispelled, yeah. Okay. I got some rumors i got to dispel with you, too, sir. Okay, here we go. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, I'm just going to introduce my guest. You're not in the force anymore, right? Just on the oh, I'm retired now. That's, okay. that's, what got, <laughs> that's what we've got for newspaper stuff for this week, and uh, I'm just going to introduce my guest, Todd Paulson. Hi. Welcome. Nice to have you with me on WindyCityHometown.com. Yeah, this is different. What has it been, about 10 years or so since I've seen you? Or what? <laughs> it feels like it. Yeah, and that's something? Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah. Todd is actually my boss. I do a show. Um, we were doing a show, and now there's a little bit of a break in that. We're going to start picking those up, um, I guess, in the relatively near future. We're going to start picking the shows up there at Wired Radio. Hopefully by summer. Yeah. And um, Todd is my, actually my boss over there. So t- today I don't have to listen to him, but when I'm <laughs> over at Wired, i got to listen to what he tells me. And, and I control everything over yeah, there. Yeah, and he usually gives me a pretty free hand there. He doesn't bother me. They don't censor me too much or nothing. I don't usually say I just wave my finger at you yeah, and yeah. I shut you up. Okay. First off, i got to dispel some of these rumors. Okay, there go for it. rumors i got to dispel. Okay, the first rumor was uh, why we haven't seen you around Argo, mm-hmm. around Argo High School for the last uh, month or so is because you've been in the conclave with the Cardinals, mm-hmm. voting for the Pope. Mm-hmm. You were. I, oh. I was considered. Oh, I didn't think so, because I knew you were auditioning but for after Fiddler. But the f- after the first vote and they found out that I was uh, auditioning for Fiddler, they... That's, d- mm-hmm. that's the thing, because I was going to say, I knew you were going to audition for Fiddler on the Roof, and so I thought you were Jewish. I didn't know they let you in there with the Cardinals. So that's you did do that, but they threw you out. Right, after the first vote. Oh, so you've been kicked out of other places, mm-hmm. too. Uh, I, I, I was the one that uh, did the black smoke, the first black smoke. Okay, and then the second second rumor, so that's, that dispels that rumor. Okay, we can click that one off. Uh, second one is that you went down on the Titanic. You sailed from Southampton, <laughs> you went down on the Titanic. But I thought this, I, I didn't think because... A hundred, a hundred years ago? Well, yeah, see, you, that would make you like 101 years now, and you only look like you're 99 years, <laughs> so I, I kind of dispelled that rumor. Thank you. In and of myself. I lotioned up. Yeah, and then the, the last rumor that I wanted to spell about why we haven't seen you on, around Warg Radio or around Argo High School for a while is because you you were with the Hole in the Wall gang with Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid out in Colorado, and you were robbing trains, and then it, that got too heavy for you, so you went to New York, and then from New York you headed over to Bolivia, and then in Bolivia they got to, the heat got up for you there. You on went the back train? To, yeah, you went back to, well, no, you took a sh- train to New York and oh. then, then a ship across the boat oh, down did, to Bolivia. Yeah. It wasn't the got, Titanic? No, not the Titanic. This one wasn't the Titanic. And then that got too hot for you. And then they said you went to Paris and had plastic surgery done mm-hmm. and then came back to the States. And I thought, that can't be right because this, if this is what he looks like <laughs> after plastic surgery... Well, that's uh, why I look 99 I, and not 100. I, I don't know. Home. Yeah, so... Any event, we haven't seen you around large for a while, and we miss you. And uh, it's glad to ha- I'm glad to have you here. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. Now, what are you doing for yourself? Uh, you, I know you are the, the station manager at Large Radio, which you still have that title. Yep. And you also have another radio station. You do Fusion Radio. Fusion Radio. Yeah. Well, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, well, at Fusion Radio, I'm just uh, the DJ there, uh, the afternoon host who does all the requests. Ah, okay. So people just kind of chat in or text in or whatever, and I play their songs for about you know just an hour. Oh, an hour every day you do that uh-huh. on there? Oh, okay. Noon to one central time. Oh, okay. Now, that's an Internet thing, right? They have yes. They get that on the Internet? Okay. Yep, all dance music. Oh, there. dance music. They dance at, what, what time are you on there? From noon to one. Oh, so people are dancing from noon to one? Yep. They're not working? They're dancing? It's worldwide. So oh. I get a lot of people actually from, like, Now, that's the only time they can Europe. get your show. What? That's the only time they can get your show. Yes. Noon to one. See, noon this, to one. this show that we're doing tonight, they'll, they'll be able to get this anytime. Yeah. They go up on like www.windycityhometown.com. Or they post them up on YouTube, too. Punch up YouTube Paranormal Radio and today's date, which would be 3 18 13. And the show will pop up so they can get us anytime Forever. right here. Yeah. Replay it if they like. Yeah, it. for all eternity, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But other than um, that, I'm just going to take a break for the station. You have another job, too, though. You don't just work an hour a day. Yeah, right? manage a gym in the morning, but that's nothing. You manage a gym, okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's just taking a station break. Literally. So to speak. Yep. Yeah. Uh-huh. Catching yeah. up on my Hulu and my news- newspapers and. And then, like I said, hopefully we'll be resuming that again. And Todd, it's glad, I'm glad to have you with you. It's nice to see you again, oh, sir. Likewise. It's been too long an absence, and I just hope that we uh, get things settled back at Ward there and everything gets back to normal. Yes. Uh, he did, um, Mr. Todd took the station over about, what, about a year and a half ago? A year and a half ago, ago yep. Yeah, and the station really, I- I've lived uh, literally outside the door of the station all my life. I didn't know we had a radio station <laughs> until he took it over. And he did wonderful stuff with that. In that short time he had that station, he really worked that up. And, and I've been there for 36 years. Yeah, yeah. 36 years what? The station's been there. Oh, I thought you were there for 36 years. No. You're not even 36 years old. I'm, I'm 99. You're 99 years old. Yeah, <laughs> nice. right. Yeah. Yeah. 
So anyway, that's that. i got to give some sponsor recognition, too. I almost forgot before I start all this jibber-jabber here. I have a sponsor now for Windy City, hometown.com, here for Paranormal Radio. Uh, my sponsor is Twisted Intentions Productions, and they're old friends of ours mm-hmm. from why we've had them on many times. Uh, TIP Productions, um, Twisted Intentions, the wonderful uh, people that we work with over there at Summit, at the Summit Park, the Dark Horns. They run the Summit Park Haunted House uh, every year, what ties us into Paranormal. Uh, I'm out there with them a couple of, a couple of hours here and there on weekends. I sit there and do palm readings for them, and they're just the nicest bunch of folks there, uh, John Schenkel and the whole Twisted Intentions team, and they are one of our sponsors here on that show. They have an event coming up this summer, June 7th, 8th, and 9th. It's the Midwest Haunted Convention. You can get information on that at MidwestHauntedConvention.com or go to the Twisted Intentions sites, TIP or Twisted Intentions Productions.com. Uh, their site will come up. And also, too, they have a thing called a zombie march. Now, I think this is a charitable, because TIP is involved in uh, some charity uh, things to do some work. And this is a zombie march, and this is on June 22nd. Uh, it's at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and they meet down by the bean thing there over in, um, what is that? Bean Park. What is it called? Millennium Park. Park. Millennium, Park. thank you. I was going to say Grant Park. It's Millennium Park, and they meet by that bean, and they'll do makeup for you free. They do the zombie makeup like I did for my movie, oh, which I right. never saw. I still never saw it. No, either. I was talking. He stopped in, and I was talking to John Shankle the other day. He st- when I got, uh, got him to do the sponsorship for us, he stopped in, in Subway there where I work, and we were talking about that. And he said, no, he hasn't seen it either. He's trying to track them down so we could get wow. that. That's my lesson I learned in life is always bring your camera. Because I was in this movie, and I don't, <laughs> don't even have a photo of myself <laughs> in this zombie makeup. So, hey, that's Twisted Intentions Productions. And you can get the information on the zombie march. They'll do the makeup for you free, and it's a lot of fun. If you've never done this, like I, when I did this film with them, they did the zombie makeup and that, and it was, it's just a whole lot of fun doing all of that. And it's, um, I believe this is a charity type thing. You come dressed as a zombie, or they'll dress you as a zombie. And that's the dark, and then also don't forget coming up in October, which is still a ways away, but the Dark Summit Haunts, they have the Haunted House with us down by Summit Park there, and they always put on a great show. Okay, that's enough of announcements. I'm going to introduce my other guest that we have with us, Mr. Michael Long. Hello. Michael. Wonderful to have you with us, sir. Thank you very I, much. You're somebody I've known kind of all my life. Quite a while. Yeah. Actually, I think we're like about the... Now, I'm 57 years old. You're... 56. 50, so you're like... you got a year on me, so you're older than me. And you're actually a neighbor. You live right down... Right down the street. My street. And yes. you're like the second block from the end... You know, the other... Uh, Mayor Strelchik lives down our street, too. Yes, he does. He's a little further down on the street. So we all live on the same street. Yes, there. he does. Yeah. And Michael is running uh, for mayor in the village of Summit this uh, spring, coming up in April, April 9th. Mike's running for mayor of Summit. And I have a couple of uh, things I have to ask you to see if you qualify for to go into to government like this. We have a couple questions to ask okay. you. Todd laughs at me because he knows the kind of questions I ask. First off, uh, corruption in government. Are you for it or against it? Well, I'm against it. Okay. I'm definitely against corruption. So you're against corruption in government? Absolutely. Uh, taking bribes for political favors, for or against? Against. My gosh. Against taking bribes for political favors? Absolutely. How about the buddy system? Like people that do favors for you, like me doing a favor for you, bringing on your radio station here, campaigning for you. Do you do bu- the buddy system? you get them good jobs and positions if you get elected for friends? You well, before that or against it? Well, I, you know, we really can't do that. Where uh, you know, there's a limited budget and a limited number of positions available. Plus, everybody's unionized now. So, I mean, what about this one million dollars that you wanted me to give to yeah. him? Yeah, oh yeah, uh, that. That's oh. that can go in his campaign fund. It's a million dollar uh, Obama dollars. Yeah. Well, I hate to tell you this, but I, I just don't think you're going to make a good politician. You flunked the test because you have to be for all the, in Illinois. You got to be for corruption. You got to be for taking bribes, and you got to be for the buddy system in Illinois. Look, I want to do that way. Yeah. Yes, also, too, I'd like, to, I'd like to just make this real clear right at the beginning here. Even though we got Mr. Long on here, Mike Long on here, I'd like to open this up to the other two gentlemen that are running for office in Summit too. Mr. Joseph Strachek, who's our present mayor, is the sitting mayor right now, and he's running for re-election. And then we have another gentleman, Mr. Ted Bojanowski. Um, I didn't seek Mike out. Mike came to me. He came to my place of work, and he gave me some stuff about his campaign and running. And I invited him to come on, and I would do the same for you, for gentlemen, too. We're going to give everybody equal time here. So if you'd like to contact me, like I said, I don't go you know, looking for you, but if you would like to contact me and you'd like to come on the, the show, we'll give you some air time here. We're going to give everybody equal. We don't want to seem biased towards any one candidate or the other. And you are running on the candidate. You're an independent. You're not yes, running with any yes, party. No, I'm... I'm Totally independent. I have no. Uh, I have no party. Just basically running by myself. Yeah. Okay. We're well, running by yourself. Geez, that sounds like you're almost like jogging, huh? You know what? It is like jogging, and uh, it's also uh, as tiring as jogging. Yeah, right? it's a lot of when work. You're running a political campaign now, by you've yourself. Got a, you got a great record, according to your little sheet here that I've got on you. Michael Long, I'm running for office in the in the uh, for village president. 
Phillips president. We're going to have to get you the White House. Well, te- te- technically the title My house is, is the White House. We'll have to yes. change houses. You'll yes. have to move in my house well, on the end of the block, the White House, and I'll have to move in your it's, house. It's actually village president, but it's co- you know the, yeah. the, the common term for it is mayor. But Yeah, and you've got some wonderful uh, ideas here. You've, it's one of the things you put in here is something I've always said myself, that we are, the Village of Summit is in such a great location. We've got great public transportation. We're very, very close to the downtown Chicago area. We've got the Metro and the Amtrak train station. All these things in um, our town could be a little we should, down there. we should be a commuter hub. Yeah, that's why I've, I've our, always said this. I'm glad someone else is, is agreeing. Uh, we, 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 we need yeah. to get our community uh, marketed towards people who are professionals and commuters who could take advantage of our terrific location, uh, bus service to, to the Orange Line, into the city, our proximity to... Uh, to I-55 to 294, uh, where we're just at, literally at a transportation crossroads, which would, which is such a beneficial item, and uh, very few people know about it. You could stop people on the street and, they, and ask them, "Where's the Amtrak station?" Most people in Summit wouldn't even know. This is true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's things that we kind of need to point a little more attention to, and that w- I would love to see like our downtown area developed and look something like what the downtown Lagrange area looks like. I think it'd be great, and I think it could be done too. The area that really, right now, I, th- I think the area that's most beneficial to us that really needs development is the Harlem Avenue corridor, uh, with the number of vehicles that pass through there on a daily basis, and you know, people, the widespread number of people that come through there. I think that'd be an area that is really ripe for uh, development right now. Ah, oh, okay. So let's see. We've got your button here. Elect Michael Long. I said we need to catch your um, slogan for you. I, I was saying like, um, don't get short. Uh, what did I say it was? I had something that sounds so benign. <laughs> hey, don't sell yourself short. Don't sell yourself short. Vote for long. Well, go long. Yeah. I, got, yeah, I, long. Think, I think go long would have been it's good, good. like yeah. I yeah. said. Yeah. You know, a football ad like, or something. Yeah, exactly. That's a great idea. Yeah. Now, I have to ask you, you are, um, in addition to wanting to run for the for the office of the village president or the mayor of Summit, you served on the police force for yes. a good 32 yes. years. Yes, 32 so years. So you're actually so. retired now. I retired February 28th. So what 28th, the heck is yes. possessing you to want to come out of retirement? And, you know, now you're at that point, I'm guessing, that the children are grown. and Oh, all yeah, my children and, are all grown. And things I've are fine. So what five makes grandchildren wanna, and another one on the way. Oh, geez. Five grandchildren? Yes, wow, and a sixth wait. one coming. So what makes you want to go ahead and do something like this and take time away from spending time with all the lovely grandchildren and all that and want to run for the mayor? I just I, I want to get our community on the path uh, to prosperity, uh, back, back to it. Uh, Back to a community that all our residents can be proud of, mm-hmm. uh, and I'm just you know very concerned about the future. Okay. Uh, you know the current, our current mayor. You know Joe. Joe's done a Joe has done a really good job mm-hmm. in the six the, the four terms, the 16 years that he's been. How there. long is the term of mayor in Summit? Four years. Oh, it's a four year term. Yeah, okay, so he's been there term. 16 years. Then. Yes, he's had okay, four yeah. terms. Yeah, he's been, and, uh, he's been there for a long time. You know, I, he's, he's got some health issues, and uh, I think it's time that you know we, we start moving forward, and that it's time for for some changes, and you know, for a new set of ideas, new set of eyes on some of the problems, mm-hmm. and maybe some new ways of doing business, and maybe we can change some things. And and there's a there's the people that I'm talking to, Bob. There's a lot of there's a lot of people that really are desiring change. Mm-hmm. I spent a lot of time over the weekend. Uh, people are inviting me into their homes, and talking about the current situation in our community. And people, there's a, there's a real thirst for change, and I'm hoping that I could be the vehicle that can that can bring that change about. Mm-hmm. Now, you have any other folks running on the team with you? No, I'm all by myself. I'm running solo. Oh boy! So okay. I, I have I have a, a number of people who are helping me, and, and they've they uh, really number number three really on my list out. was the buddy system. You know, you're going to have to get some cronies in that office with you there, and you know, help you out. They think the way you think. You know. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, they're they're helping me out with a lot of the street work. I mean, and they're doing it without any promises, which is, uh, you know, which is always good. Okay. Well, there it is. That's the ticket that Mike Long is running on, and uh, that election will be coming up April 9th, and we still have time for that. And like I said, if uh, Joe Strelchik, Mr. Strelchik, would like to come on uh, the air here with us, uh, if he wants to get a hold of me, we'll make sure he gets a little bit of equal time, too, to come on and, and speak his piece. And the other gentleman that's running, Mr. Ted Bojanowski, too, uh, if he, they'd like to come on, uh, if they want to get a hold of me, we can give them some airtime on here. And uh, that's that. Now I'm going to change gears here a little bit. You were on the force for 32 years. Yes. I got, see, i got to throw paranormal stuff in here. They're going to kick me off the air because this show is paranormal. It's not political. So. I understand. How many encounters have you known of uh, Resurrection Mary, our favorite ghost over there on Archer Road there? Uh, I personally know of none. I, I don't oh, recall. Oh, come on. I'm, I'm serious. In Summit, I'm, there's got to be something. Bob, I'm telling you, I don't recall <laughs> any, I don't recall any <laughs> Resurrection Mary sightings, reports, calls, any, you know. The, last of that nature. the only I, thing I can I can tell you is that you know every Halloween, uh, uh, the Justice Police Department would always have somebody over there by the main gates on Archer and you know on the perimeters of the cemetery, and there would always be somebody who 
somehow would sneak their way into the cemetery and be running around, and then after a while when they figured out they couldn't get out, you know, that they were locked in, they'd be calling Yeah, justice would actually be a little more involved in that. Um, in actuality, I can, I can say this much of the story, but I can't give the name, because I said I would never give the name out. But uh, one of the summit police officers, well, I'm not sure if he's still on the force or if he's retired now from the force himself, but one summit police officer uh, related to Stormy Chimbo about three years ago that he actually had an encounter with Resurrection Mary driving along Archer Road. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, so if he was a summit police officer? Summit, summit police officer. Apparently he kept it to himself because... Well, he revealed it to me, but I, I, said I, wouldn't say, I said I wouldn't say his name. I would relate the story, but I wouldn't say the name. Okay. The, okay. the story was he was going for a lunch. Uh, and just in case you don't know, I guess, I don't know how I would have to introduce Resurrection Mary. Resurrection Mary is probably our most famous Chicago area ghost. She's our hitchhiking ghost. Um, Resurrection Cemetery there in the late 1920s, 1930s, to make the story short. Uh, she was hitchhiking uh, at the old Henry Ballroom, which is still there. It's the Willowbrook ballroom, uh, was hit by a car, killed, and uh, buried in Resurrection Cemetery, and her spirit walks along Archer Avenue, and there's a couple of different versions of that story. I talked to him on my, the introductory show I did here with... Uh with Has Wendy's anybody hometown. ever identified who Resurrection Mary? Well, they could actually be? have. Yeah, there's a couple of them. Yeah, there's. You can listen to this show more often. We talk about this all, like every week. Well, I just found up. out yeah, about <laughs> this show. At the other yeah, there's day. a there's a gentleman, yeah. Mr. Ray Johnson, who's been. A, he was a guest of mine. Oh, a few times I've had him on Wagner. We're going to get him to come on this show too. Uh, Ray hasn't contacted me yet. Well, we'll get a hold of him and we'll get him on here. And he does a lot of research into that. And they're, actually, they got to kind of narrow down to like four four names for her. Anyway, she's buried in the Resurrection Cemetery. She haunts that stretch of road along Archer Road. Uh, gentlemen have been known to pick her up in their car at odd hours of the early morning, and then she just says, you know, stop here, vanishes off into the cemetery, disappears, or people have also been known to run into her with their cars, and then she vanishes into nothing. That's where the Justice Police come in, because the Justice Police, if someone, not so much a sighting of Resurrection Mary, or someone says they picked her up, if someone says they picked her up, they kind of think they were spending too much time at Chet's Melody Lounge across the street there having too many drinks. So, But if someone says, I think I hit someone that was a hit and run, then the police do come and they make a report on it because then they say, well, we have an accident here. Okay. And they look for a body, and then, of course, they don't find it because it's Resurrection Mary. So. But nothing you heard, huh? No, no. Or, I, are you just I've keeping never... yourself clean here because you, no, know, you don't no. want people to think you're crazy here I, with this? I, well, I, I people don't. People already think I'm crazy, I don't, so I don't care what I say. I don't want so people then, to think I'm yeah, crazy, yeah, but yeah. I, in all honesty, I don't recall any... Uh, I don't recall any incidents involved. Nothing at all, huh? No, no. Hmm. I, 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 you're, you're, used to you're a local about resident. Todd, you're from Bridgeview. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know, some resident. Yep. You lived in Bridgeview for many years. How many encounters did you have at Resurrection Mary? On my way up here. On your way up here, you encountered her? No, never. Oh. I never had anything. I, I, I will talk about that. Um, seeing the... Because I lived at a street where I could look right down at the cemetery, and every time in the Halloween, you think you see something walking through, but then you realize it's a cop car. Oh, that was me. That was me out there walking around. Probably. Yeah. That's how we first met. Yeah. That was, that was always me out there walking. <laughs> <laughs> with the white no, dress they, on? No, not yeah, with that the white makes dress. Sense. Oh, that was me. No, my what, dress. About, what about that story about the... Uh or along Archer, there were like the gates where the in the, in the oh the hairpins are that like that where the thing is kind of like pulled, yeah, pulled through, open right. or something it was like that. Yeah. dented out instead of dented in, so yeah. it couldn't have been a car. If you go look at them, um, they actually had those bars replaced. Did they? But if you go if you go look at them, the fingerprints are still in those bars. Yeah, they are. If you take a closer look at them, they're still in there. So on um, Catholic cemeteries, uh, I've talked about this too, and nothing against you know Catholic. Uh, cemeteries or Catholic Church or anything like that. I don't want to sound like I'm coming down on that in any way, shape, or form. I'm Roman Catholic myself. But the Catholic cemeteries in our area come down very, they're like no connection to supernatural at all. Uh, if you were to go to Resurrection Cemetery and say anything about Resurrection Mary or ask or say something to like inquire about her grave where she, or her name or something like that, they'd say who? They just don't. They don't play up to the uh, supernatural. I would, I would imagine most most yeah. cemeteries try to downplay that. Yeah, the Catholic possible. cemeteries do around in our area. Now I'm going to talk a little bit later tonight. I'm going to talk about uh, some ghosts in New Orleans. In New Orleans is it, totally different. Catholic cemeteries in New Orleans just totally play up to the supernatural. Uh, they're all for it. It's just no problem there at all. It's just different ways they they handle it, you know. And like I said, nothing against them. It's just that's just our way of handling it. Uh, so nothing to do with Resurrection Mary, huh? No, no, uh, nothing. That, Bob, nothing that rings a bell. Hmm, okay. There's that old joke about ringing a bell, but I can't say that one on the air. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> Do they still have the Resurrection Mary cocktail at Chet's? They, they still put the thing. There? You know what, though? Um, a while back. And when I song. Yeah, when I, yeah. I was just going to say, I was just going to bring that up. Thanks, Todd. When, when I first started doing this show here, one of the people, hands down, one of the people I first wanted to do uh, my show with Warg, when I started doing the Paranormal Radio Activity Show with Warg, was Richard Crow. Long-time friend of mine. Everybody knows Richard Grohl, you know, famous name in Chicago, Supernatural and all that. And Richard, oh, sure, Bob, I'll come on the show. So I said, Friday the 13th, perfect night for Richard Crow to come on. And then I told him, every Friday the 13th is yours. You come on every Friday the 13th. Well, then he passed away. He passed away last summer, June 9th, I believe it was. Richard died uh, and left us and um, is buried in resurrection, incidentally, too. And um, 
I said, Richard, do you have a copy of that song, The Ballad of Resurrection Mary? For years they had that on the jukebox at Chet's. And I went into Chet's and I talked to Rich Pruszynski, who owns Chet's Melody Lounge over down Arch Road, and I got him to come on as a guest. And I said, Rich, you don't have the song. And he said, no, we, it was an old 45 and we wore it out and everything's digital now and we don't have it. So I talked to Richard about that, and Richard knew everybody everywhere. He got a hold of the guys that wrote the song, and for the life of me, I wish I knew the name. I would give him some air credit. Uh, and they sent me a CD of it, and we made sure that he got a copy of it to put back on. And then a few times, too, he played it over the air uh, with Wargan, and we made sure um, people could hear the song. It wasn't... Actually, it wasn't all that great of a song, but, 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 it, was just, it, but, but it was just part of the local, these local... Local guys did to this? Well, they live in California now, but I believe they lived in Oak Lawn. I might be wrong on this. I believe they lived in Oak Lawn originally, but he made sure I got a copy of that, you know. Do you remember what the name of the song? Uh, the Ballad of Resurrection Mary. Ballad, okay. Ballad of Resurrection Mary. I, yeah, doubt if it's, I doubt if it's on iTunes. Hmm? Well, no, I think <laughs> I, 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 I remember I, I burned it. Onto my, oh, my, did you? my iTunes, but no, I don't okay. remember if I would have. Yeah, it. I gave him it, and then he was he was supposed to make me a copy. But when you give him something, it disappears. You know, you never see it again. But I did get it back. <laughs> okay. I got it back. Anyway, we've got about uh, oh, what do we got? About thirty-five minutes here, half hour to go here. I'm going to talk a little bit because, like I said, I've got to do paranormal stuff here, and then you guys just jump in anytime you want here with this. I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about ghosts. Uh, the go- which would be wonderful for paranormal. Oh, I also got to mention that's a rare thing. Yeah, that's a rare thing to be talking about. That's all I talk about, huh? Uh, what I want to talk about a little bit is New Orleans ghosts. New Orleans is one of my favorite cities. It's also one of the most haunted cities in the United States. I love New Orleans. Every chance I get, I love to go down there. A uh, lot of lo- haunted locations in New Orleans. Uh, just talking for a minute here, we talked on cemeteries. Uh, visiting cemeteries and touring the cemeteries in New Orleans is a big tourist attraction. Uh, you know, in in New Orleans, they really play up to the the supernatural, uh, and the cemeteries in particular. One of the oldest cemeteries they've got there is St. Louis Cemetery Number no. One, and that is the uh, home of the burial place of the reported Voodoo Queen of New Orleans, Miss Marie Laveau. Uh, Marie Laveau has got a, like a long history in New Orleans, and you can't talk about New Orleans and voodoo and supernatural history without mentioning Marie Laveau. Uh, she was born in 1819. Uh, she was married. Uh, the marriage was a short one. Her husband died, and then she took up with another gentleman, but there's no record in the church or anything of her ever marrying him. And she um, lived a long life, uh, 1792, I believe, till 1881 she lived, and she bore 15 children. Uh, Marie Laveau became the voodoo queen of New Orleans, and part of the way she was able to do this was she was also a hairdresser. Her trade was a hairdresser, and by being a hairdresser, she was able to get into the homes of a lot of the wealthy society ladies in New Orleans and stuff, and when you're dressing people's hair and doing that, you gossip. So she was able to pick up a lot of gossip, and she could use this and, and, you know, different rumors and things she heard and make people believe she had extra superpowers, although she was a very, very big in the voodoo uh, in New Orleans, and she was the voodoo queen. Uh, Marie Laveau died, uh, is buried in St. Louis Cemetery Number no. 1, and people visit her tomb all the time. Every time I'm down there, if I take a tour to St. Louis Number no. 1 uh, Cemetery, you, you put a few X's on her tomb, and you leave some little trinkets there. There's always things around her tomb, uh, and supposedly she still grants these wishes, and then once a year, supposedly, her ghost uh, reappears. Uh, also, too, for many, many years, uh, there was a story that floated through New Orleans up to oh, the early years of the century. She died 1881. Uh, up till about the turn of the century and a few years beyond that she actually was reincarnated and come ba- uh, came back. But what happened with that story, they kind of disproved it because she had one of her daughters, one of her 15 children, was a spitting image of her mother, looked just like her. And she looked like the young version of Marie Laveau, and a lot of people said that that was her, but it wasn't. It was actually her daughter that they saw. That's my little story about um, Marie Laveau. Uh, interesting lady, if you ever get a chance, pick up a couple of books on her. There's many things been written about uh, Marie Laveau and her voodoo practicing in, in the city of New Orleans. One of my favorite spots in New Orleans is the Blacksmith Chapel, Lafitte's Blacksmith Chapel. It's one of the oldest buildings in the Mississippi Valley, and it's right on the corner of the Bur- of Bourbon Street in St. Philip. And usually when I go down there, I stay like on St. Philip Street there, and so I walk right by it all the time. Uh, it's an old, old building. It's uh, Like I say, it's one of the oldest ones, and it's called, um, it's it's what they call the brick-between-the-posts construction. If you look at it, it looks like if you leaned on it too hard, the thing would fall over. Uh, it's made with bricks and posts all showing. You leave the plaster off so you can see how it was made. And it's supposedly a very rep- uh, reputedly haunted building. Um, the ghost of Andrew Jackson pops up there, and the ghost of Jean Lafitte himself. Uh, supposedly this is where a lot of his smuggling operation, a lot of illegal goods that the pirates, uh, Lafitte brothers, pirates, brought into the city of New Orleans came through this building. Uh, busy in the slave trade, smuggled drugs, uh, 
just all sorts of textiles and goods and just whatever people would have wanted. Everything changed hands and came to And supposedly this is where the Battle of New Orleans was planned with uh, General Jackson, too. Andrew Jackson likes to haunt around all over the place. He wants the White House. They talked about the White House a couple times here and there. What about Jackson Square? They Jackson should... Square is named after him. I know it's that, haunted. but is, if he's not, it's no, the, no... Ch- the, the church there is haunted. The St. Okay. Louis Cathedral there is yes. haunted by a couple of the priests there. Pierre Antone, he haunts it. So However, I... there is a hotel, the Andrew Jackson Hotel. His ghost has been known to pop up there. So he pops up at three different places? He's all over the place. Yeah, he's every, he pops up everywhere. Yeah, he doesn't. Oh. He wants New Orleans at the blacksmith shop and the Andrew Jackson Hotel, named after him. And that's on 919 Royal Street. A lot of my favorite haunts are on Royal Street down in New Orleans. Uh, his ghost has been known to pop up there. And also, too, in the early years of the 1700s, well, later years, 1794, the hotel, the building, was actually used as a boys' school for boys. And there was a bad fire there, and uh, a lot of the children were killed. And now the hotel is adults only. Uh, it's an adults only hotel. Children are allowed in that hotel, but guests have been known to stay in that hotel and hear sounds of laughter of kids and running up and down the stairs. And uh, they've also been known to encounter the ghost of Andrew Jackson in there. Yeah, that is quite a that is quite a mystic city. It is. Yeah, that it's is really a fascinating something. place. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My original ambition was to go down to New Orleans and and be a tour guide down there and and move just relocate and move down to oh, Orleans. Yeah. But Katrina took care of that though. I would never do it now because you uh, just never know when a disaster like that's going to happen. happen. Wonderful again. city. It's nice to visit and everything, but I really just would not want to live there. Yeah, I went last year and loved every minute of it. Yeah, yeah. I try to get down there whenever I can. I think about three years ago. I went there after Katrina. I know that. And I always tell people don't go at least the first time for Mardi Gras. No, 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 oh, no, definitely not, not. not. No, definitely not. Yeah. No, one time I was for the Mardi Gras. And I would myself. I wouldn't do it again. <laughs> I did it one time to experience right. it. But if you want for the first time, no, you don't if you want to have experience the city and the restaurants and everything, yeah, no, you, see yeah. you, can't, you can't do yeah, that. Yeah, not during the Mardi Gras. No, you're elbow elbow people. No. Mm-mm. Yeah. Now we have these things called the Pontalba buildings, and those are on Jackson Square. If you've been to, to New Orleans, you know Jackson Square. You have St. Louis Cathedral, and then on each side of St. Louis Cathedral, you have the Cabildo Building and the Presbytery, which are now one house is the Louisiana State Museum, and the other building house is a Mardi Gras Museum. One building in the originally was the courthouse for uh, the city of New Orleans under French rule, or Spanish rule, that was. And the other building was actually built as a presbytery, as a home for the priests of the cathedral. But it was never used for that, as what happens in New Orleans so many times. Plans get changed with things. And now they are museums. And then flanking those, it's a very beautiful square, Jackson Square, are these two very long red brick buildings. Almost, uh, uh, They are identical, not almost identical, they're identical. And they flank both sides of... Jackson Square. I think one is on St. Anne Street and the other one is, I think it's Jumain Street. One is called the Upper Pontalba Building and the other one is called the Lower Pontalba Building and they are haunted. Um, they are actually apartment buildings, apartments up on the top floors and the ground floors, like so many of the homes down in the French Quarter, are shops, which they still are today. And uh, one of them that haunts, haunts the uh, Upper Pontalba Building is the ghost of none other than Jenny Lind, the famous uh, opera star. Uh, Jenny Lind had done a North American tour and uh, toured and stayed in New Orleans for a while and stayed in one of the Pontalva apartments. Uh, Jenny Lind was known as the Swedish Nightingale. She sang very beautifully. We have no recordings of her. We do have some, because uh, Jenny Lind didn't quite make it into the recording area. She uh, lived 1851 to 1887, so we had recordings in 1877, but they weren't quite yet that good. Uh, so she didn't make it to the turn of the century, so we have no recordings of her voice, but her spirit's been known to... Um, been seen there walking up and down the staircase in the apartment going to and from and also singing out on the balcony. So we have some haunts in New Orleans. Um, one of my favorite haunts down there is the LaLaurie Mansion. I talked about that a lot. It's probably one of, one of, if not the most haunted buildings in the United States. And that is on, um, I think it's 1140 Royal Street. Like I said, there's two of my favorite ones. The Andrew Jackson Hotel is 919. And I didn't write the address down here, but I believe it's 1140 uh, Royal Street for the LaLaurie Mansion. Uh, that building's got a very sordid history to it. It was owned by, um, actually, the gentleman that took it now is actor um, Nicholas Cage, the actor. He actually bought the building. I'm, last I heard, last time I was down there, I think he bought it. I don't know what he's going to do with it. I think but, he's. Uh, I think he's already sold it. Oh, he got rid of it yeah, already. He said there's yeah. a bankruptcy issue. Yeah, yeah he has a lot of, oh, a lot of financial okay. problems. Oh yeah, I know for a while he was trying to move into Graceland too. He was trying to marry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What's her name? Lisa Marie Lisa and moving to Graceland yeah. and all that. He's got like an Elvis thing. I like think an Elvis so. Yeah, thing yeah. It. yeah. Anyway, he bought that, but now I guess he does not have it because he went into bankruptcy, which would be go with the curse with this building. Uh, it was originally owned by Madame Delphine and her husband, John LaLaurie. And her husband was a surgeon. Uh, and this was in the 1840s, 1850s of New Orleans history and slavery. I mean, Louisiana being a slave state, they owned slaves. And... Um, Lorries were very well liked in society, very well known in the New Orleans society, Creole society at that time. Uh, gave really extravagant parties and balls, and it was the you know the, the cream of the crop were always invited to these things, and they went on like seven days a week. But people, guests would come, and they would notice that their slaves and their servants looked kind of thin and gaunt, and not like they were the best cared for and everything. 
So this was not too well liked amongst the hierarchy there in New Orleans. Uh, and they actually had a thing called the Code Nor, which was the Black Code, where you had to treat your slaves a certain way. You couldn't mistreat them. And uh, Madame LaLaurie was found guilty of, of mistreatment, and um, her slaves were actually taken away. But then having money and having power and knowing people in the right places, they got them back. Well, all this kind of came to a head one day um, when there was a fire in a kitchen building, which is in, in New Orleans homes. The kitchen is always a separate building, not connected to the main home for reasons of fire in those, in those days and to conserve heat because kitchens are always hot and in that humid, hot climate down there, you want the heat of the kitchen and the fire is as far away from the main house as you can. And there was a fire, and the fire department came to extinguish the fire, and uh, up in the attic they went, and they found a very grisly sight they discovered. They found a woman chained to the stove, where she could only move like maybe a foot or two away from the stove, chained there, and that was her job with that. And she was pointing to a door that led up to a higher attic, and um, they went through this door, and what they found just made them sick. Um, her husband, like I said, Madame LaLaurie's husband was a surgeon, and he did all sorts of surgery on slaves that they had up there. Uh, he, there's evidence that he did a, a very primitive sex change operation to one. Uh, one woman was found just a torso only. She had amputations done to her legs and arms. Uh, just all these horrible things and disfigurements to these people. So, of course, they hauled these folks out of there, and they found many corpses as well, too. So they were killing a lot of people up there, too, a lot of their slaves. So these people were hauled out. They took them over to Charity Hospital to do what they could for them. And then the crowd, the mob in New Orleans, caught wind of what was going on, and they were going to lynch the Lalauris. But they hightailed it out of New Orleans. They were able to escape, got away in their carriage, and no one knows where they ever, uh, actually went to. They said they went across to Lake Pontchartrain. On other rumors, they went across to Europe, to Paris, lived there for a while, I guess, where they were from originally, and then came back to New Orleans. No one really knows. Uh, but in any event, that home is one of the most haunted homes in that city. Uh, even to this day, if you ask for the haunted house, people will point out, uh, the LaLaurie Mansion to you. Um, it's never rented out, to my knowledge. If, if tenants do come in there, they stay a very short time. Last time I know there was an antique shop there, and they had a lot of strange behavior, so they didn't stay there long. Um, the upstairs of the home is never really rented out, and like I said, for a while, I thought Nicholas Cage bought that, but then now I found this information out tonight that he sold it. Um, it's just one of those types of homes. Um, I've been down there on a few of the tours through the quarter and stuff like that. And one time I was with a group, and uh, some of the girls in the group said they got a, one girl that was very, very psychically in tune. It was a mother and daughter, and they were really neat people. I would like to talk with them more if I could. We did spend some time together talking after the tour. And that, um, but she said she got a real creepy feeling being in front of that house. And I says, yeah, it would stand to reason because all this activity went on there. Uh, to this day, people see a slave run off the uh, porch, uh, fall to her death. Uh, they hear voices, uh, they hear chains rattling, uh, there's actually a headless cat that walks through the building, blood has been known to roll down the stairs in there. So a lot of things that would scare people away from that building. Um, that's the Lori Mansion. One of my favorite stories, the bottom of the teacup. <laughs> this is um, a little, it's actually an occult store uh, in the French Quarter, and I don't know the exact address of that one. Um, I think it's 940, I don't know it, no, 940 I think is the... Uh, Marie Laveau's uh, shop on Bourbon Street. Anyway, the bottom of the teacup, the, it's haunted by a ghost named Julie. Uh, the bottom floor of that home, that building in the French Quarter, is called just that, the bottom of the teacup, and it's actually an occult store where they sell occult books and paraphernalia, and they do readings, palm readings and teacup readings and all that kind of thing there. And then the top floor of the house is a, a private residence. has all 99% of the homes down in the French Quarter. That's how they are. Uh, and uh, in the old days of New Orleans history, uh, this home was owned by a very wealthy man uh, in New Orleans, and he had a wife, and then in those days you also had a mistress. And his mistress was this Creole, very beautiful Creole lady named Julie. And um, he had Julie put up in this house here. And this was all very legal and everything. It just might sound odd by today's standards, but in th those days you did this. You could have a wife, and then you went and you had a contract, and you had a mistress, and you had everything was in this contract, you know, how you're going to take care of this woman. If children came out of this relationship, what their status would be. Uh, if you chose to end this, how would this go? Would, how would the property divided? Would she and the children have this home? And, you know, how, all this, it was, you know, very something you thought out. You didn't just do this and move in and live with someone. So he had his wife that he was married to through the church, and then he had Julie, who was what they called an octoroon, and that's one of these, these women that you married like this that was contracted. Well, Julie had everything she could want under the sun, you know, jewelry, clothing, everything, you know, a nice life there in New Orleans society, but she wanted the legality of the marriage. So she was always after her, mm, I don't know what you want to call him, her partner, to uh, her lover, to marry her, and he would not divorce his wife, being Roman Catholic. He wouldn't, because that would have meant excommunication from the church. So he finally got tired of all her pestering him about this marriage and said, well, if you do this one thing for me, I will marry you. I want you to go up on the roof of the house naked and stay there overnight up on the roof of the house. 
And if you do this in the morning when I let you back in, I will marry you. So him thinking, well, of course, she's never going to do this. Being a proper lady, she's not going to do this. She did. She took her clothes off. She went up through the attic windows, went up on the house, and uh, it got cold that night. She was up there naked, and um, what happened was she tried to get back in the house, but all the shutters were closed. Servants had the house locked up. Uh, she couldn't get in. She wound up staying on the roof, and the next morning her husband went to her room to look for her. She was not there. Bed had not been slept in. So he says, oh, no, she didn't. Well, yes, she did. She went up to the roof, and she did as, she, as he said she would, you know, to do, not thinking she would do this, and she stayed there naked, and they found her body uh, huddling the chimney naked, and she was froze to death because it had gotten cold at night. One of those rare nights where it actually got cold in New Orleans on a December night, and she was froze to death. And her ghost is seen on a certain new e you know, evening in New Orleans in December when the conditions are just right and the mists blow the right way off the Mississippi there. Uh, people have been known to see the ghost of Julie walking along the garret on the top of that house, uh, the ghost of a very beautiful black um, octoroon woman, which Julie was. Okay, I think I will stop. I did have something here on the werewolf. Um... Yeah, we have a whole cult in New Orleans on werewolves. We have a whole vampire cult down there. Uh, we have these people that are wannabe vampires. Oops. Something supernatural just happened there. Anyway, the werewolf. Yeah, the <laughs> werewolf. I guess it was that werewolf oh. talking they did. Yeah. And uh, we have a whole cult down in New Orleans. We have them up here, actually, too. I found this out not too many months ago, of these people that live the vampire lifestyle and this kind of thing. Uh, but werewolves I've not heard of. Uh, vampires and werewolves kind of go hand in hand, although they are... Known in New Orleans. What we have tonight, I'm just, and this I'm going to read out of the book, this I don't know by memory because it's a little involved. And this is a spell of a werewolf, which you can actually do, although I don't recommend you doing this. You can do this if you want to become a werewolf. It's possible to do this. Um, I won't read this whole thing because it's very lengthy and there's a whole thing involved in this. And uh, a while back I did a show on WARG and I did uh, on Egyptian and Egyptology and that. And uh, the similarities between the werewolf here in New Orleans and the werewolf in ancient Egypt are it's, ext it's extremely similar. The whole ritual you'd have to go through. Uh, first full moon, this is how it goes. First full moon of an autumn at midnight, you repair to a forest clearing. You take two concentric circles on the ground. You trace two circles on the ground, one six foot, the other twelve foot in diameter. Enter the circle, you build a fire. You spend from an iron tripod, an iron pot filled with water from a flowing stream. Uh, as the water boils, you throw in a handful of aloe, belladonia, hemlock, poppy seed, and deadly nightshade into the cauldron. When the liquid reaches the boiling pipe, uh, point, you uh, disrobe, rub a salve over your naked body. It says rub a salve over her naked body, but the werewolf could be a man too. So you rub it over your body if you want to become a werewolf. Uh, the salve is composed of a flat of fat of a freshly killed sheep or a goat mixed with anise, camphor, nutmeg, and opium, approximately an ounce of each. They're pretty precise about this recipe here. And after the body is covered with the salve and the aspirin, you wrap a length of wolf skin. Now, I don't know where you get the wolf skin, but this is real similar to the story in ancient Egypt. They did almost the same ritual in ancient Egypt, so it must have been something apparently handed down through the years. So werewolves and vampires are nothing new. That's what I just wanted to point out by doing this. Um... You wrap this skin around your waist, you kneel, and you begin to visualize the astral body of rage, which confers this frightening gift. Immediately after this visualization exercise, you should say aloud with great passion and conviction the following lines. And this I won't read because it's a very lengthy prayer here. I'll just read a little bit of it at the top and then some of it at the bottom here. It's hail, 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 great wolf spirit, hail. A boon I ask thee, mighty shade, within the circle I have made. Make me a world, strong and bold, the terror alike of young and old. Grant me a figure, tall and spare. The speed of the elk, the claws of a bear. It sounds like, like a witchcraft potion here, doesn't it? Uh, poison of snakes, the wit of the fox, the stealth of the wolf, the strength of an ox, the jaws of a tiger, teeth of a shark, uh, the cat that sees in the dark, make you climb like a monkey, scent like a dog, swim like a fish, and eat like a hog. I know a lot of people <laughs> now that eat like hogs that aren't werewolves. I know a few people that eat like hogs. Just waiting for these mics to start squeaking. Yeah, they're not werewolves. Yeah. 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 And now I'm going to just jump to the bottom here, and then it says, Make me a werewolf. Make me a manhunter. And you repeat this three times. I pine for blood. Human blood, give it to me. Give it to me tonight. Great wolf spirit, give it to me. Heart, body, and soul, I am yours. And it says, If this ritual is successful, a dark answer will be made to manifest, accompanied by wind, screams, and an ineffable growling, and the form will continue to gain substance until the sorceress or sorcerer is confronted by a huge half-wolf, half-human abomination uh, in fantastic size and power. And after this manifestation is complete, you will become a werewolf. Uh, the other way you become a werewolf is if you are the same as you do with a vampire, is if you are attacked by one, uh, wounded, and you live. If you don't die, then you become a werewolf yourself. 
So nothing new with that. So these are all stuff from the history of Louisiana, and it's a spell that you can do, although they say in the book right after it, they recommend that you don't do this spell. So, <laughs> so, so don't <laughs> after they give you the spell. Oh, I, should, yeah, I, should, I should stop yeah. right yeah. now? Yeah. The whole thing. yeah, and you were yeah. trying it already, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So we have about 15 minutes here, and mm-hmm. we're going to get back to Mr. Mike Long here. Any closing comments, Mike? Here, anything you'd like to say about your campaign and why people should vote for you? And you know, um, uh, now what you need to do is you need to start dropping off some more of your literature around town there. Yes, it's, like it's some it's of the public, <coughs> public places there, so people can hear about you. It's get, it's it's slowly but surely getting out a lot more, Bob. Uh, mm-hmm. Just that I, I, you know, I hope people would would give me uh, some serious consideration. Uh, looking at the other candidates, you know, the they're both up there in years, uh, which is which is. Just a coincidence, but uh, you know, I have the I have the the drive and the passion and the the desire to make our community a great place, to make a place to make it a place where people will uh, you know be proud to say I live in Summit, and people will uh, people from the outside to look at it and say you know what that looks like a pretty good place to live. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. I might want to I I would consider living there because there's a lot of options there. You know, there's there's tremendous diversity, ethnic diversity, religious diversity, cultural diversity, and again, our advantages with our with our central location, our access to the city, and all our transportation opportunities, and we're just not selling ourselves properly, we're just not marketing ourselves properly, we're not developing ourselves properly, and those, those are some of the things that I would like to do, and just, again... You'd like to do, but you got any, like about the developing the property, maybe getting businesses, you got any ideas in uh, any specifics, anything you would do specifically? Well, well uh, I'm giving away too many of your secret ideas here, you know. Well, really, uh, really, all you can do in the beginning is to try and, and identify areas for development and um, work with, you know, try and find some developers who are interested in, in, in coming into your community to, to open up some new businesses and working with them. And, and actually what I would like to do is, is to work hand-in-hand with the, part, with, the, with the property owners and developers and, and try and market our community to potential investors and developers and say, and attract hey, people and in. Attract, yeah. And attract yeah. investors yeah. in. And say, I think what we, we, all do, we all just haunt the whole town. You know, just say it's haunted, like, <laughs> yes. like Alton, yes. you know. Yes. Right. Haunted town and just bring all, the, all these paranormal researchers and paranormal people. We could open up occult bookstores and stuff in town. Bring New Orleans feel yeah. to yeah. Summit. We could, be, we could be the Midwest version of uh, New Orleans. Yeah, wouldn't that be cool? Well, we can reproduce the French Quarter, you know, down on our road. It's an idea. It certainly is an idea. <laughs> he won't you say know. no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's an idea. Just something to roll around. Yeah, yeah, that's well, all. Yeah. Yeah. I'll roll it around yeah. for a while, all right. Yeah. Personally, myself, if I ever run, I'm going to run on the ticket that I would guarantee chickens in every backyard and a Yugo in every garage. I've so, heard. Yeah, you yeah. know what? Yes, that's right. <laughs> Never mind. We don't talk about that. Anyway. Oh, okay. Okay. Anyway. Uh, we'll <laughs> okay. What is the Yugo story? Uh, no, I drive uh, Yugos. I, really? I, yeah, I got the only Yugos like within a hundred miles radius of where wow. we live. Yeah, wow. I got to that, fi- that fine Yugoslavian <laughs> technology. <you know? laughs> yeah, yeah, the worst car ever built. But it's been running for twenty five years, so I'm not going to complain. Yeah. Okay. Well, Michael, thank you. It's well, wonderful. Thank, thank you, you know, so much for coming on. I and, really, um, I really appreciate it. And there again, the folks. Um, now remember, this you can pick up this uh, interview here with Mike in there if you'd like to listen to this uh, paranormal radio uh, on YouTube. Go to paranormal radio and then punch today's date in, which would be three. Um, what is today? Three eighteen thirteen, and that will do it. Or you go up on our windycity dot com home uh, windy www windycity hometown dot com on the Windy City Hometown Network. And also, too, check out some of the other shows they've got on there. They did a show this morning, which I didn't come to because it would have involved me. Uh, it would have involved me staying up here um, the whole day here for the show in the morning and from the show here at night. Um, they do meet the Chicago hor- historians in the morning. And they have a panel of folks here that are very knowledgeable about the history of Chicago and stuff, and they talk about different, just about every different facet. So check out some of the other shows that Mr. John DeVita runs here. And also, too, I need some sponsors here. I do have a sponsor, Twisted Intentions Productions. Give them a plug again. Uh, check out their website and the wonderful stuff that they do there. They get a lot of the kids from the high school involved in their the haunted house activities and stuff like that. And they're just a nice bunch of people. John Schenkel there and the whole team with with TIP. Oh, and Mr. Dan McGrail, too. John was telling me that you um, they were doing something, and he cut his forehead and got 12 stitches. So I don't know if this was long ago or if this was recent, but uh, get well, Dan. Uh, they nicknamed him Duck, and uh, uh, get well, stay well, guys. And uh, thank you so much for your sponsorship and uh, for the nice work that you do over there, the good job that you do with the Dark Summer Haunts in uh, Summit Park. Mr. Todd Paulson, that familiar face. Yes. Thank you for coming on the show, sir. Yeah, of course. It's nice to be in, on the other. I know you're in, you're in, what are you now, in semi-retirement, or what would we call this? Purgatory. You're in purgatory? Yeah. Oh, my. How do you ever get out? You know, now, I never, I never knew hot, this. Is it hot there? Now, wait a minute. I thought they got, I thought they got rid of purgatory. I remember as a kid going to church and saying prayers for the poor souls in purgatory, uh-huh. and then all of a sudden they said, no, we don't have that anymore. One of the popes, somebody got rid of purgatory. So what happened? Did I think it was the, the Benedict got rid of it. It was, I think it was cutbacks. 
Oh, is that what yeah, it was? Yeah, they didn't have the they, money to they, finance they purgatory anymore? They couldn't so. keep purgatory going. So <laughs> they couldn't keep that. purgatory going, yes. right? And then they yeah. put in all those electric vigil candles in the churches, yeah, so they well, had to, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. because we used to say prayers for the poor souls, and then they said, no, we don't have it anymore. So I'm like, well, just because somebody said we don't have it now, that means everybody got out. That's yes. why I'm there, because it's pretty lonely right you're, now. You're kind of just in a holding spot. Now, purgatory, uh -huh. if, uh, my understanding, you're kind of between heaven and hell, yep. and at some point they'll decide where you're going to go. Yeah. Oh, my. And if it's back to WRG, I don't know if that's heaven or hell, but it's... Oh, now you know that's heaven for you. You love <laughs> WRG. You got this... Oh, no. Don't ever yeah. say something like that. No, he loves WRG, and he does... Uh, the great job you've been doing over there with it since you've had it, uh, mm -hmm. you got to love it. If you didn't love it, you wouldn't be doing the things you're doing there. True. Yeah. Besides, if he doesn't go back, I don't get my show back over there, so... <laughs> how, how, far, <laughs> how far a broadcast range does it cover? It goes, um, you know, obviously from Summit. It, it doesn't go as far north, so it kind of cuts off at Ogden, but it okay. goes as far as down to Tinley. Really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't realize it's a, that. It's a, a southwestern antenna, so okay. it goes all the way to 355, all the way to, like, Orland Tinley, oh, okay. like 159th. Okay. So we're yeah, my community son, My radio. son, uh, when he was in high school, spent some time you at went, Did you go to Agra, too, Mike? Did you no, go? no, I went to St. Lawrence. Oh, it wasn't good enough for you, huh? <laughs> no, it, it was fine. Actually, and the funny thing is, is my mom worked there at the time. But uh, so, because your mom worked there, you weren't allowed in. Well, she didn't want me. to Well, we had Mrs. There. Wright, my my yes, next door neighbor, absolutely. Mrs. Wright worked there. She and she, I think Mrs. Wright actually worked in the attendance office. Mrs. So yeah, you yeah, cancel me ever taking a day off from school? I would. They would have found out about it right away. You know, oh, yeah. look out yeah, their window. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's the, that's our uh, summit story there, a little bit of our politics. And also, too, I need to extend the uh, invitation out once more, uh, Mr. Joe Strelchik, uh, who's the sitting mayor in summit right now, running for, running for re-election again. Uh, sir, you're welcome to come on this station, and we'll give you some time, too, just as we did for Mike Long here, and your other uh, opposing candidate there, Mr. Ted Bojanowski. Uh, sir, you're welcome to come on here, too, and say a few words for a few minutes here, too, and uh, we give yeah. you equal timing here. Because don't, be, try don't be surprised if you hear from Ted. So. We try, yeah, no, we try to stay unbiased yeah. here. I try not to, you know, be... Poli political. My show is actually not a political show here, but I thought you're worthwhile. You know, it's worthwhile bringing you on here. And I really and appreciate it too, Bob. No, you're very I welcome. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, really it was nice. Did. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It was good to see everybody. That's you know, that's how it's connected through Bill Rush. Yes. I was reading palms over at the um, Chucks over there on Natchez. Oh, and, and, and he came in okay. Burbank, right? And, and they came in with a group, and, that, and I was talking to him, and he mentioned to me that you were running, and that, and then I guess he said, "We'll drop off some stuff to Bob there," and yeah. Thank you, gentlemen. We have about uh, ten minutes left here. Let's fill the air time. Oh, I almost forgot. Yeah. We got to do the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Yeah, yeah I almost forgot go. about that. I said I was going to do this. Now, this is um, just to kind of set this up a little bit here. The only reason I did this, I actually brought this record with me a couple times to Warg Studios, but I never got around to playing it. We did some things with some of the opera and some other old recordings and things I had on there. Uh, this is an old Columbia recording from about 1908. Uh, so the sound quality is not going to be the best on this. It was an acoustic recording. It was an electric recording, and we're playing it on some old equipment, too. Is that a, was that a Victrola? That's a Victrola. Yeah, that's okay. what they're called. Yeah, the old little wind-up phonographs that they okay. used to have, yeah. And um, it was actually a vaudeville routine that was done on the stage, a stage performance. Uh, and this man's name was Len Spencer, and he was kind of like a house artist. Uh, he renegated to a lot of different companies. He recorded for Edison. He recorded for Victor. He recorded for Columbia. And um, this was done on the stage, and supposedly he did this whole transformation scene on the stage in front of the people, and he would swirl the cape around, and he'd put the makeup on and the whole thing, and he would terrorize, and women in the audience would faint and everything. And it's a transformation scene of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Now, I don't know how well this is going to sound, because like I say it's an older... Uh, recording here so the quality sound quality Where's is not going to be the it's in the front oh, okay it's, so it's an use your mic it's a victrola it's an interior horn machine it doesn't have the horn on the outside right. so it's inside so we'll do this and let me get this thing started here and uh, we'll play this 1901 for you. 1908 yeah it's a 1908 oh, yeah. recording yeah and it's a transformation of doctor and it almost sounds like a radio broadcast because you do have the sound effects of the bells and knocking on the door and all that stuff and so um that's, that's the way it goes and we'll see how it sounds over the airways here we go Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Wow, that sounds really. Yeah, wait a minute. This must be the Broadway version. Yeah, this is not too good. Let's see here. Let me get it going again. Is this one I'm going to be getting free tickets modern for tomorrow? Modern technology, yeah. Modern, te modern technology, yeah. I got something wrong here the way I got this thing going. Okay. This is why we let you go over at Argo. That's what happened to me. I couldn't, I couldn't work the equipment properly yet. Okay, I think I got it going now. Okay, here we go. I have long sacked London in vain for the drought which has been the cause of all the misery. Half an hour after I have taken the last drop, I shall speak into the terrible creed of his wicked men. This then is the last time Henry Seek. 
still can see his own face or think his own thoughts. I am losing my original self and becoming more and more incorporated with my one nature. I'm sorry, Uh-oh. I'm messing up. Uh-oh. Yeah, I'm messing up. I mean, it fits for the Jekyll part. I can't get it going here. I'm sorry, guys. Let me get rolling here. And I typed this out at home ahead of Whoa. time, too. Would I have the courage to take this part? What can I be? The demon is coming. Hades? Ah, no. Not yet, thank God. What's that? That's my own life. Let it be, my pastor. Maybe they had a lot of helium back then. Let it be, my pastor. 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 Let